the passionate kisses of lovers often lead to a baby, and the first shy kisses of adolescents often lead to love. But in couples in a relationship, kisses that are less and less frequent announce a breakup. Whether you leave or not, you'll try to kiss a new partner, and more than that, if there's attraction. For the first time, we're inviting you to follow the emotions, behavior, and the mental processes that precede and follow the drama of the last kiss. Which leads to the question, are we not serial monogamists? That means in reality polygamists that are faithful many times. A specialist of human sexuality wrote, with humor, that monogamy was an ancient Western custom that consisted of having just one wife and just a few mistresses. European surveys have revealed a divorce rate around 70%, as well as a tendency to have multiple partners, on average 19 for men and 9 for women. But is this a universal tendency? Out of a total of 850 human societies observed around the world, 84% are polygamous. In most Western cultures, marriage and religion have inspired social and sexual monogamy, staying with the same partner and founding a single family. But the breakdown of this tradition has made us change partners often many times. So, are we not serial monogamists? Most of the answer is to be found in our animal origins, because animals don't get married. <laughs> Professor Jacques Balthazar studies polygamy in a large number of species, notably among quail. Classically, it was thought that women were much more reserved in their sexual choice and that they spent a lot more time choosing a male and then wanted to keep him so that he could help them to raise their young, whereas males could throw their sperm to the wind and copulate with a large number of women so as to maximize their genetic heritage in the following generation. Now we see from DNA tests that females are in fact relatively selective in their choices of males, but they also copulate outside the couple, which allows them equally to maximize their genetic diversity. It was long thought that the stork was the symbol of sexual fidelity. Is that really true? The two male and female individuals collaborate in the raising of the same group of chicks, but when you look closer, well, you realize that in the nest there will be eggs which have been fertilized by different males. Yes, in fact, DNA testing shows that the great majority of bird species considered to be monogamous produce young outside the couple. In blue tits, for example, in geese, that can be between 30 and 40 percent. Yes, yes, at Liège we've studied kingfisher nests with young from three or four different fathers. And in mammals, well, which are largely non-monogamous, it's been found that between 10 and 30 percent of the young are from outside the couple. Yes, exactly. So here are a couple of gibbons, a mother with her child apparently, and it's thus amongst the primates the only species which to our knowledge is monogamous, which lives in a stable couple. But then we realize that despite this monogamy, which is known as social monogamy, where stable couples are formed during a long part of life, there are equally sexual relations which take place outside the couple. Yes, DNA analysis has found that there's up to 12% paternity outside the couple. There's even a species of lemur where there are 44% of young outside the couple. And we're not talking about polygamous species at this point. So you can see here we have an animal species, a species of herbivore, where the male is clearly larger than the female, which is in fact a sign of polygamy in mammals. And you can extrapolate this to mankind. Well, perhaps it's possible because we find this size difference in humans, the man being 10 centimeters larger than the woman, and other differences which among mammals are again associated with polygamy, such as greater aggression in males, for example. We therefore think that biologically man is predisposed to be polygamous. Et sans hésiter, elle nous dessine Le petit chose et les deux orphelines Tout, tout, tout
vous saurez tout sur le zizi, le vrai, le faux, le lait, le beau, le dur, le mou, qui a un grand coup, le gros touffu, le petit joufflu, le grand ride et le mot. We can establish a relationship between testicles and the social systems in which animals actually live. The gorilla, where a male maintains all the females under his control and thus has no need to compete with other males for women, has small testicles. If you take the chimpanzee and the bonobo here in this enclosure, the bonobo has a social system where sex rules everything, with competition between the sperm of different males inside a female so as to assure paternity, and we thus see this relationship between social systems and testicle size. Yes, but is this the same in men? Well, we can't make experiments on men, but they have a testicle size which is between that of the gorilla and that of the chimpanzee, if you allow for differences in individuals, of course. Of course. And so that suggests that man has a polygamous tendency and there is therefore a frequency of mating which is relatively high in the human species in comparison to gorillas. In our closest cousins, the chimpanzees and the bonobo, polygamy is the general rule. However, in primates, polygamy exists in relation to testicle size. And is this the same in men? Professor Maggi has measured testicle size in 4,200 people. Francesco, can you measure the testicle volume to see if everything is all right? Perfect. Start with the right one. We're starting with the right one. It's close to 30 millilitres. A characteristic of men that have extramarital affairs is bigger testicles and better penile blood flow than men that do not have extramarital affairs. We have to say that normal testis volume is 20 millilitres. What we found in our previous research was that men that have extramarital affairs did indeed have one milliliter more testis volume than the others. Do you have extraconjugal sex? Yes. Is this occasional, a stable relation or both? Occasional. Currently, how are your erections with your wife and with your other partner? Here's an erection. This one's quite weak. This one's about right, and this one is optimal. I'd say that with my wife it's two, and with my mistress it's four. At Albany University in the United States, the link between the shape of the sexual organ and sexual competition is being studied. Penises come in different shapes and sizes. The chimpanzee penis, which is our closest living relative, is tapered from the base to the tip. The shaft of the human penis is uniform from the base to the tip. At the end of the penis, there's what's called the gland, it has a ridge that encircles. And we believe that the glands and the coronal ridge evolved to displace rival male semen away from the cervix to enable males to increase the chances of achieving paternity. Vous saurez tout sur le zizi, le vrai, le faux, le lait, le beau, le dur, le mou, qui a un grand coup, le gros touffu, le petit joufflu, le grand ride et le montpelé, tout, 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 je vous dirai tout sur le zizi. So, should we load some semen in a syringe? That's about right. That'll work. Yep, that should work. Okay. To validate this hypothesis, scientists injected different mixtures into an artificial vagina, the viscosity of which was close to that of human sperm. The result of this synthetic coitus was that 91% of the pseudosperm injected moved up and swept towards the vaginal entry. All right, Becky, we're, now we're going to conduct a control trial with a penis that approximates the configuration of a chimpanzee penis. In the absence of a ridge, the figure falls to 35% of sperm evacuated. Long penises are more effective for semen displacement than short penises, which is one reason why the human penis is much longer 
than those of the other great apes. There's some pretty good evidence that there are adjustments to the composition of an ejaculation that vary as a function of whether there's been a threat of female infidelity. If the threat of female infidelity is high, the number of sperm in the ejaculate is correspondingly much higher. So there are mechanisms operating at the level of te the testicles that take into account the context in which the sexual encounter occurs. According to Professor Robin Baker, adultery has many biological consequences for the way human sperm is constituted. If a woman is having an affair, then of course there's a really good chance that she will have sex with her husband and with her lover in a short space of time. In which case, she'll have inside her sperm from both husband and lover, and these will compete, uh, fight it out for the prize of trying to fertilize any egg that she produces. One of the experiments that we did was to take sperm from different men and to mix them together and then look and see what happened to them over a period of time, about 12 hours. As a control, we also mixed together sperm from the same man. And when we mixed sperm together from two different men, we found that they were a lot more dead than we did when we mixed sperm from the same man. Brain room. According to Robin Baker, there are several different types of spermatosa. Those which are normal, hunters aiming to fertilize, killers which destroy competing spermatosa, and finally there are those which have an abnormal shape and seem feeble. These could be the blockers, with the mission of blocking enemy sperm. Even if this theory is far from unanimously agreed, no scientist has yet understood why an average of 40% of spermatosa are abnormal in shape. We recruited 30 couples and we asked them not to throw away the con just to go about their normal lovemaking, but not to throw away their condoms, but to give us the condoms so that we could count the number of sperm. But just occasionally the woman uh, gave us one and wrote on her, her thing, well, this wasn't actually with my husband, this was with somebody else. We could look at the sperm, look at the different types and the numbers and compare the sperm for, that a lover put into a woman and the husband put into it. His, his wife. And what we found was that the, the husband tends to put in, of course, some egg getters, some killers, but he puts in a lot of blockers uh, so that if his wife did have sex with another man, they couldn't get through. But what the lover puts in is much more uh, killers and egg getters, obviously there to try and get through and to fertilize the egg, despite the fact that a husband might have put in blockers. That's what people say, right I would love to know who wins this competition between the sperm of husband and lover. We can't know because you can't do those experiments. It would be unethical to ask a woman to have sex with two men and see which one fertilizes her eggs. But the, my expectation is that the lover will win more often than the husband. And there are two reasons for this. The first reason is that a woman is less likely to use contraception when she has sex with her lover than she is when she has sex with her husband. And the second is that the woman is more likely to be unfaithful during her f the fertile phase of his cycle. Lots of evidence uh, has shown this for all sorts of um, tribes. And so these two things would suggest the lover wins more often, but we don't know. What we're going to do today is we're going to fill out some questionnaires about sexual behaviors, uh, some sexual behaviors with your romantic partner, and possibly some sexual behaviors uh, with people other than your romantic partner. And these are very specific questions about sexual behaviors. Okay? So let's hand these out. Here's one for you. For you. There's one for you. And I'll take you to your testing rooms. Here we go. And just follow me. Okay. So if you could go into room C. That Professor would be great. Rebecca Birch has tested more than 300 people. 
Thank women, you specifically women, when they uh, go and they cheat, their sexual satisfaction is much higher than when they are in a relationship. Uh, they enjoy it much more. And the men who cheat also enjoy it much more. Um, but when women go back and have sex with their partners, uh, it's, it's very unsatisfactory. They do not want to have sex with their partner. They try to put it off for as long as possible. Uh, and they report that 85% of the women in my data uh, actually say that when they have sex with their partner, it's their partner that initiated it. They did not want to have sex with their partner. Their partner really wanted to have sex with them. <sighs> If the man knows that there is another man, that this woman is having sex with someone else, he's going to try very hard, and uh, the thrusting does change quite a bit. The thrusting is harder, there are a higher number of thrusts, it is more vigorous, it is deeper. All of these things are going to aid in greater semen displacement. And if she has had sex with someone else, uh, then he's going to try very hard to uh, make sure that any other ejaculate that was in her reproductive tract is gone before he ejaculates. It's been shown statistically that during their ovulation period, women are attracted by men who are very masculine by their physical appearance and their deep voices, but that they themselves become more attractive, especially because of the tone of their voices. The biology of women is such that the mucus of their vocal cords, which can be seen here, has the same cycle as the mucus of the cervix. When women ovulate, if they change their voice to be higher, they may be trying to sound more attractive to attract mates. And this could be because they are looking for genetic benefits in reproduction. Yes, talk to me. I want to hear your voice. We're attracted by the deep voices of men and the high voices of women. But astonishingly, these attractive voices are seen as encouraging infidelity. Yes. Oh, come. What you're going to be doing today is listening to pairs of voices and choosing which you think is more likely to cheat on their romantic partner. So what you have to do is press play and listen to one voice all the way through, P press play on the next voice and listen to that one all the way through, and then choose which you think is more likely to cheat on their romantic partner. You can press start and go ahead. We found that men with a lower pitched voice were perceived as presenting a greater infidelity risk when women listened to their voices. Now, when men listened to women's voices, it was the higher pitched voice that they perceived as a greater infidelity risk. I've chosen you because some of you are ovulating. You'll see on the screen images of men which change. I'm going to ask you to indicate which image attracts you the most. All three of you have chosen the most masculine version of the face. Could it be that you are ovulating? These masculine traits are indicators of a high rate of testosterone, the male hormone. During ovulation, women look for men with a very masculine physicality for sexual relations. Women associate the facial attraction of men to genetic indicators of quality in reproduction. Those seeking one-night stands are mostly in couples or married. This is what was shown by this Italian study of around 200 women. After having met these men, evaluate the attraction that you feel for them on a scale of 1 to 10. This person is single. And what degree of attraction would you give him? Six. This person is married. Do you have a partner? Yes. And from an evolutionary point of view, the preference of attached women for men depends on her menstrual cycle. If she's in a fertile period, she prefers single men. 
in the period that she's fertile, the good genes become more and more important. And she might consider getting the best of both worlds, keeping her long-term partner, but secretly commit adultery with a handsome masculine man. In fact, the right progenitor has to be available immediately. If she's in the infertile period of her menstrual cycle, she prefers attached men. Attached men have a proven relationship capability. Single men do not. Wollen Sie Frau Nicole Holzinger, Herrn Konrad Schöndorf zu ihrem Gemahl nehmen? Ja. Good reasons why women are not necessarily interested in young men. The first is that older men are still fertile. Herr Schöndorf. And the second is that older men tend to be further ahead in their career, tend to be wealthier, and that can be quite attractive to women because the wealth allows the man to better take care of his children. You'll see on the screen several versions of the same man's face. I want you to tell me which one attracts you the most. Usually that's not my type of man, but what I noticed with him was his very square jaw, masculine, and with his air of certainty. And probably his clothes too. You've chosen the face of a man who is older than you and who wears carefully looked after clothes, shirt, jacket. This corresponds to the fact that men who are older have higher social status and greater economic resources. Biologically, women are actually predisposed to choose men with more resources and therefore older. Elsewhere, a study has revealed a general tendency in men, whatever their culture, to find themselves with women younger and younger than themselves the older they become. For example, at 30, they prefer women of 25 years of age in average, whilst at 50, they prefer 35-year-olds. This shows that women accept and seek relationships with older men, of which the majority have already reproduced. The one who has the resources won't necessarily be the biological father. According to genetic studies, 10% at least of all children are born outside marriage. We've seen that several biological factors predispose humans to a certain sexual infidelity. But can we follow that path in an even more radical fashion? Maybe some genes encourage one-night stands. The surveys are completely anonymous. They'll ask questions about your uh, demographics, your background, and particularly your relationship, um, your romantic and sexual relationship history. What we found is that in these 181 young adults, um, that there was a strong association between uh, the variation in the DRD4 gene and uh, things like infidelity and one-night stands, uncommitted sexual behavior. Uh, individuals with the variant of the gene that are predisposed for more sensation-seeking were more likely to commit infidelity. They committed infidelity more often when they did, um, and also more likely to have a history of one-night stands. <laughs> In the case of infidelity, it was a 30% difference between the groups that had the variation of the gene and that do not. Uh, for one particular gene, 30% is quite substantive for uh, behavioral differences between the two groups. We are starting to understand more and more about how genetics influences love and sex and relationships and, and sexual desire and function. <laughs> Um, so we're getting more and more information about that, but we have to be really careful about how we use it. Biology can play a very important role in making us uh, who we are and our desires. But we aren't prisoners. We're always able to do things that are different than what we might be predisposed for uh, biologically. It just can be hard sometimes. Ah! Oh. 
In this study, we found no differences between men and women. In fact, both men and women have the same uh, frequency of many genes, including the GRD4 gene, and both men and women have very similar frequencies of uh, sexual behavior, such as infidelity. Often we think that men have a lot of sexual desire and things like infidelity and uncommitted sex, and women just want love and babies. What really rigorous science is starting to tell us is that both men and women have strong desires for love, for sex, for children, for family. Uh, so we know that there are certain genes, genes that are involved in mate choice, uh, things like MHC, major histocompatibility complex genes. Um, and they're important for actually how uh, we're attracted to someone. What it's really important for is whether we like the smell of our partner, or that sexual, that raw sexual attraction part, uh, which is often important in initial stages of relationship and when to keep it for long-term romantic love. The genes of our immune system, known as CMH, are special to each of us. They determine the smell of our body. We seek a body odor that is very distinct from our own. Scientists attribute this attraction to the biological programming of women to choose genes different from their own for their baby. Many companies commercialize genetic compatibility tests. But be reassured. Most of these tests confirm the good compatibility of many long-term couples, as if nature has a nose for things. We've studied long-term couples, and it was very clear, that is to say, that about 80% were really genetically compatible. This means, in fact, really far apart genetically. Close genetic proximity provokes adulterous desires. Another hypothesis that explains our degree of sexual infidelity would be the activation of our cerebral receptors by hormones which push us or don't push us to seek new partners. One of the things that's very fascinating to me is that if you look at the perivole and you look at the metavole, on the outside they're almost identical. It's very difficult to tell them apart. But then if you look at their behavior, they are very different in their behavior. Perivoles crave social contact. The metavoles just don't care about social interactions. And what is really fascinating to me is that if you can look in the brain and tell these species apart, based on the location of the receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin. This is an image showing the distribution of oxytocin receptors in the monogamous perivole brain. This is the part of the brain where drugs like cocaine and heroin act to produce reward and reinforcement. And the monogamous species has lots of oxytocin receptors in this brain region. The non-monogamous species have none. So I think that this is a really key difference that allows these animals to be able to form social bonds, whereas the metavoles are not able to. And in humans, we know that oxytocin uh, increases trust. It increases the attention that one uh, pays to other people, the amount of time looking into eyes. It increases empathy, sort of these feelings of uh, understanding others. I think that there is quite a bit of evidence that the same molecules that are promoting this monogamous bond in these little rodents are involved in human relationships as well. I would actually argue that we are very similar to prairie voles than are to meadow voles. So for example, even though we say that prairie voles are monogamous, they will occasionally have an affair. If the male is wandering around and another female comes by, he may mate with that female. But the important thing is that that male will come back home to the nest with his female partner. And he will spend many years together with that female partner. That is very different from 95% of all mammalian species.
Larry Young has given his monogamous prairie voles, which are like us, sometimes a bit less than faithful, a few grams of extra fidelity. This is a computer program that automatically analyzes the position of each animal. So we use this to determine who the animal prefers to spend their time with. In this cage, we have three animals. One is the female who is free to move around to spend time with whoever she chooses. The other is a male that she has never seen before. And over here is the male that she was with last night while she was experiencing that drug. And if we can just quantify how much time they spend next to the partner that she was with last night or the novel guy, we can determine whether they've formed a bond or not. And as you can see, this, this couple right here, the female clearly prefers to be with her partner. And she doesn't care too much about the novel guy. With these extra molecules of faithfulness, 100% of the voles have given up affairs completely. My research is, is really addressing whether there is a biology behind the ability to form a bond. And in nearly all species, we, there is that ability to form the bond, particularly between the mother and the baby. But only in a few species does that ability then extend to sexual partners. And in humans, we call that love. And in voles, we call that bonding. According to English scientists, human evolution thus would have selected and conserved the characteristics of dominant males to be good reproducers and good parents, this by their social status and their greater economic resources. But the advantage of dominant males pushed them to disseminate their genes in a maximum of attractive and receptive females. But these biological principles don't explain everything. Women nowadays can accede to powerful status, men often losing their socio-economic supremacy. Above all, selection of partners is no longer founded exclusively on the desire to reproduce. So the causes of the infidelity which has been seen over the last 30 years are to be sought elsewhere. And even if moral conscience forces traditional couples into social monogamy, the desire for new experiences often pushes them to reject sexual monogamy. Otherwise, the daily events of modern family life can favor the breakdown of a faithful relationship. Children can have a huge impact on a relationship. Um, it changes the whole nature because for the first time a couple has to focus on something other than their relationship. And a child generally means less sleep, uh, less money, less time for each other. Dr. Gonzaga is the coordinator of an ambitious study which aims to analyze the important phases that a couple goes through. He has therefore followed over five years, 300 voluntary households. Good job, honey. Mm. Mm. How are you doing? I'm good. Mm -hmm. You think that's better? To heat it first and then put the medicine in? I guess, I mean, that makes sense. A lot of the negative emotions couples feel after the arrival of children really have to do with the fact that the stress they're under uncovers the day-to-day -day emotions they're feeling. So they may become more frustrated or more anxious with each other. But the real impact can be that because they're tired, because they're stressed, they're less able to regulate and keep those emotions from filtering into their relationship. To analyze the interviews, Dr. Gonzaga is assisted by another psychologist. 
Um, what I'd like you to do is to pick out one of the areas that you have some disagreement about, especially how that might have changed since the two of you uh, have had a baby. Okay. In the first discussion, which is going to last 10 minutes, Jarrett, you're going to talk about your topic of the amount of time spent together since the baby came along. Um, you guys will be filmed during this interaction. Those are our cameras up there. Also, um, you're going to be using the computers that you see here uh, to fill out some questionnaires today. I'm going to be in the back. You guys can just wave at the camera, and I will chime in on the intercom and give you guys further instructions. OK. OK? Sounds Great. good. All right, guys. I have such a demanding position on, on, on what I do <laughs> that it takes me away from, from you guys, from the baby, I feel a little bit um, left out of the process because there's times with Claire, I'm feeling like she doesn't know me as well. Mm -hmm. So clearly he's struggling uh, with the same thing a lot of parents do, that when a new baby comes along and there's demands, mm -hmm. um, they can't meet all of the things that everybody wants. Especially for husbands, I think that this is a very common theme for husbands, feeling that they are left out and they want to be more involved and not understanding or not knowing how to balance the demands of the work life the and demands life. of the home life. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think one thing we could do is just have you interact with her more, because I think it's my natural <clears throat> desire to, you know, take her and, and solve the problem for us, you know, and right. I think maybe it's good to just right. try to let you hold on to her and soothe her and, right. and let you have more of that time with her. But I think maybe once we meet once a week for lunch or something would be a good idea. Yeah, no, no, I'd love to do that. He says, I'm happy now with my daddy. I'm happy now with my daddy. But what can be done against frustration? Yeah. Couples who plan and think about when to have kids how it's going to affect their relationship, tend to remain relatively satisfied with their marriages. One of the things that comes out in relationships as people take on different roles, their partner may not appreciate them, and they may not be as good at each one of those roles. Someone who is an excellent husband and a fun partner may not be the best father in the world. They may need to learn those skills, and sometimes that's an adjustment for couples. Stop. Fini. Bah, j'étouffe, tu comprends? Bah, salut. This young couple with children has met some problems in the bedroom. They are followed by Dr. Salomoni, who is advising them. So we've cut out the TV, the computer and cell phones. How are things now? At first, with the birth of the children and work and everything else, Going to bed was the only moment we had to ourselves. I could watch TV and relax. He could listen to music. But really, we lost contact with each other. The results of our study on the effects of television in the bedroom are quite surprising. Because we saw that couples with the television in the bedroom make love twice less often per week than usual. So we found out that television influences couples a great deal. And sexuality is all right? Are you getting closer? Slowly, slowly. It's been a bit better. Apart from the television, there are also cell phones and computers in the bedroom. And people take them there before going to sleep, which can lead to problems for sexuality. We know that 67% of young men and 64% of young women go into the bedroom with a cell phone, which is often used to send SMS to the lover. 
money is well known to be one of the major causes of arguments. Researchers have shown that when the man is financially dependent on his partner, the risk of infidelity increases. In most relationships, the husband makes more than the wife. However, in a small percentage of the population, the wife makes more than the husband. In these relationships, the man is more likely to cheat. In fact, the man is about two and a half times more likely to cheat on his wife. If you're not able to take care of your family, if you're not that primary breadwinner, this is emasculating. And one way that you might try to reinstate your, your sense of masculinity and your masculine identity would be to go out and have multiple sexual partners. If we go to a restaurant, we see a man and a woman eating dinner, and the waiter brings the bill to the man. The waiter expects the man to pay, not the woman. So in this particular instance, if a man has brought the bill and he can't pay, he might feel particularly emasculated. We've seen that fidelity is endangered by daily life. However, not everyone succumbs to external demands. What holds them back? The fear of a passion too strong that finishes with the suffering of failure? The fear of losing a faithful partner whose parental investment is beneficial for the children? The refusal of the lie, etc. Cerebral processes intervene in this careful decision. Because in the real world, people have to react very quickly and almost unconsciously to threats of infidelity. In the lab, we created cognitive experiments to see would people just shift their attention toward or away from an attractive person of the opposite sex. Please, touch me like this. Oh, yes. Please. I'm coming. We are equipped with strategies to protect ourselves in these situations. And that strategy kicks in. It's almost like the tape starts. Attractive person, uh-oh, trouble, what do I do? Avoid that person. Thanks to virtual reality, John Lydon has shown that in a few milliseconds, our brain can identify a risk of adultery and can block an external solicitation. The candidate had the choice to enter in several rooms. In each of them appeared briefly the image of an object or of an attractive person of the opposite sex. We saw that women avoided the attractive alternative by distancing them. The women pushed images of attractive men further away from them compared to images of other things, but the men did not. Even though we found that women were better than men in protecting the relationship, there were some men who protected their relationship and some women who didn't. In another study, John Lydon asked men and women living in very stable relationships to evaluate the level of attractiveness of people of the opposite sex, showing them photos. Unsurprisingly, participants gave the best scores to the people who seemed the most attractive. But later, he showed them the same photos, making it clear that these people wanted to meet them, and then the reaction was surprising. We'd like you to form an impression of that person. You have all the materials. You can now begin. All of the participants gave scores which were a lot lower than the first time. According to John Lydon, when attachment is important and menaced, we have an instinctive tendency to say to ourselves, really, he or she isn't as good as all that, even if there is attraction. Even in the 21st century, we see that relationships are good for people People who have relationships tend to be healthier. All that helps to protect people and to create almost a psychological immune system against these threats. 
Jealousy is a function which protects the relationship from the intrusion of sexual rivals. That of men fears most the loss of sexual possession and is rather paranoid, which is where their violence comes from. I'm going to ask you to imagine, thanks to this mirror, that the person who is in the film is your partner who is being unfaithful to you. Try hard to concentrate. Even though it clearly isn't their partner that they see in the film, the simple fact of imagining while more or less concentrating will trigger the activation of certain zones of the brain. These experiments reveal different cerebral activation in men and in women to whom the image of sexual and emotional infidelity has been suggested. These experiments recorded physiological reactions of stress and facial expressions of fear. The men reacted especially to scenes of sexual infidelity and the women to scenes of sentimental infidelity. Generally in men, the amygdala is active, which corresponds to the fear and aggression zones, but also the hypothalamus, the sexuality zone. In women, on the contrary, the hypothalamus is less activated. Hello. Hello, darling. Hi, sweetie. Oh, hold on a sec. There's someone at the door. Oh, Barbara, it's you. Oh. I've missed you so much. We must be careful. My wife might catch us. Kiss me, Tiger. Darling? Hello? Well, Barbara? <laughs> Darling! Come on. I can't wait oh, any longer. Oh, Barbara. Oh, I'm so crazy about you. <laughs> oh, Barbara. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Compared to previous research, which stressed that men and women experience jealousy quite differently, our research would indicate that jealousy is m more connected to the psychological uh, background of an individual, particularly their attachment relationships. In other terms, the intensity of the relationship, of the life shared by the couple, is also primordial and influences the brain zones. Securely attached individuals are much more concerned about the mo emotional aspects of relationships and are more likely to be jealous with regard to uh, indications of infidelity around emotional connectedness and that dismissing individuals tend to be more concerned about the sexual aspects of relationships and therefore are more concerned about potential sexual infidelity. And this is true of both men and women. If you tell me that a woman is dismissively attached, I will predict that she will be more bothered by sexual infidelity. Now imagine your partner enjoying passionate sexual intercourse with someone else. This woman, who isn't sure of her partner, activates in fact the zone of fear, but also those of sexuality. In contrast, uh, this securely attached woman in the sexual infidelity scenario is not showing the same pattern of activation. In fact, the blue uh, is indicating relative deactivation. It's indicating that this is not threatening to her uh, in any way. And likewise, and surprisingly, um, we find deactivation for securely attached men. It is very important to realize that when we observe the development of a stable couple, well, the kisses are reliable thermometers for the length of relationship and the quality of the sexual life of the couple. After several months of intimate, but also exclusive relationship, well, we notice that the partners kiss less and less spontaneously. Also, that it's very important for the women to get a lot of them, and the man doesn't think they're that important. At certain moments, it even happens that the kisses are no longer received with a smile of pleasure, but without receptivity. 
The woman refuses by turning her head to the other side without a smile or by looking down, and sometimes she gives a little gesture like this. You have to know that when this is repeated, it's the precursory sign of breakup, and progressively the kisses are going to be refused, and in certain cases will even provoke disgust, a kind of very powerful psychological disgust. The morality is there because there is already a thought of seeking a new partner to kiss. Hello, Renny. Hello, Alexander. Can you confirm that when they have decided to break up, some women feel disgust for their partner? Completely. For some women, that's the case, and we're going to see that this morning and talk about it. So, to understand what precisely disgusts you about your partner, if we take, for example, oral sex, is that something that you can still do with him? No, it's everything. Total disgust, the smell, everything. His smell is already difficult to stand? Yes. Do you have the impression that his smell has changed? Yes, it's a smell that has become very strong for me. So it already disturbed me at first, but I didn't realize. It wasn't like that, but... Uh, As I say, you can't stand his smell. That's exactly how it is. Thanks to this mirror, you can observe attentively the photo of your partner, and we're going to record your brain's reactions. When you feel disgust, a zone of your cortex, the insula, is activated. It's the same zone that reacted positively to the saliva of kisses and smells when you were in love, and now it reacts in a negative fashion. Normally, women are stimulated by films which visualize their erotic fantasies. This is not at all the case during a breakup. The precursory signs of breaking up are very often behavioural. Dr. Gable observes couples talking, the words that are used, the expressions and the gestures which qualify the relationship as a couple. By observing a short interaction in our lab, we see it as a kind of a clip into their relationship life at home. So we're able to get a pretty good idea of what the quality of their interactions are and the quality of the relationship is like in real life. But when we are collab, what we found is that one of the best predictors of future relationship quality and stability is how couples respond to positive events. So, I just got some really good news today that I didn't tell you before. I just got a promotion to project manager. Really? Wow. This is, yeah, this is news to me. Did you, did you, were you, did you apply for this job? Yeah, I applied for it, I guess it was about a month ago, and I didn't really think I would get it, but I'm super excited about it. It's a big step up. Wow. So does this mean more hours? Yeah, yeah, I'll probably have to work, I'll probably have to work more, but it'll be good. Okay. It's, it's good for my career. So then I'm going to have to do more work around the house and... She's quite active, that she's, she's participating in the conversation, which is, is good. She's not sitting quietly. However, everything she's saying is negative. She hasn't said anything to congratulate him. She hasn't said anything enthusiastic. She hasn't shown any positive emotion at all. And quickly she turned the conversation to how this event affects her. Um, is she going to have to do more housework because she's not being passive? And what she's not doing is conveying any validation to her partner, any caring or any understanding of why this is important to him. According to Shelley Gable, these models allow the prediction with a reliability of 90% of the risk of breakup for a couple within three years. We've tested couples who've been married for a long time. We've tested dating couples who've only been dating for three months. And we find that this type of a pattern, this not being able to respond well to positive events or being able to respond well to positive events can occur at any stage of the relationship. Behavior which does not participate in the feelings of the partner can itself announce a breakup. 
But breakup is also possible because of chemical monotony. After 12 to 18 months of amorous sexuality with the same partner, the rate of cerebral substances which activate desire has diminished. It's habitual. Yet that of sexual pleasure persists, notably dopamine. From this comes the risk of having to satisfy sexual demand with a new partner. So, how long has your breakup been going on? Uh, it's been already three weeks, more or less. And how do you feel? I'm in withdrawal. I want to call him to see him every day. I know it's not good, but that's the way it is. It gets me in the stomach. It gets you right there, eh? But you know that finally it's quite normal, because love triggers a cerebral circuit that we call the reward circuit where a quantity of substances circulate which act like drugs that give us pleasure. And breakup is therefore a brutal severance. And that's because this pleasure circuit remains associated with your partner and it takes time to disappear. And I can tell you that your amorous brain could stay active for several months more. Love can lead to a suffering that is all the more intense because it is passionate. This is because the chemical substances liberated by the brain are implicated at the same time in pleasure and in suffering, in happiness and unhappiness. It can be understood why some couples accommodate a sexual infidelity or even a breakup without giving up trying to recover their partner. In the same way, others are happy to see each other again, to find that attachment of love, often a pathological overattachment without any sexual demand. Emotional breakup isn't a fatality. To reinforce fidelity, you must, for example, know how to separate, then to meet regularly, thus creating short severances for the pleasure of finding yourselves again. You also have to be aware of the behavior which announces breaking up or share once more strong emotions with the partner. Dr. Gonzaga brings out the elements which make couples last. I think really there are three things when you look at a satisfying and successful relationship that shows it's a satisfying and successful relationship. And they're the underpinnings of intimacy. Um, one is caring, that they care for each other and are able to show each other caring. The second is understanding, that not only are they able to express their emotions, but they're able to understand what the other one is feeling and thinking. And the third one is validation, that they accept their partner and they validate them for who they are, which makes both individuals in the relationship feel better. There are lots of things externally that can show that a relationship is successful. Um, everything from their day-to-day -day interactions to how they handle stressful times. One of the things that my research has discovered that even something as simple as whether they show genuine smiles to each other, whether they gesture in positive ways and move towards each other and touch each other are indicators of love and that a relationship is going well and is being intimate and bonded. Here, let me help you. <laughs> All right, guys, it looks like you Dr. Gonzaga asks couples to evoke their teasing moments by mocking each other gently, because the ability to approach certain subjects lightly and with humor is important for cementing a relationship. David, it is your turn. You'll have two minutes to share your nickname and story, and we will chime in when the time is done. So I had DA, which is like dead after. <laughs> dead after. <laughs> Because after we have, oh. I've never in my life <laughs> seen anybody go to sleep so fast. No, no pillow talk, no. <laughs> <laughs> no.
no, no snuggling, no nothing. I can't get back from the bathroom. And you, you are out like a light. Done. Over. Nice. That's nice. Thanks. So they're extremely playful and right. able to tease about something that's very intimate to them, but both right. laugh at the tease. And yeah. very expressive. Very expressive. Lots of positive emotion. Right. <laughs> It's not complete, it's funny. She's got a fair amount of embarrassment. embarrassment yeah. which, which is actually what you want in a tease because that right. embarrassment allows the, the closeness to be enhanced. There are three features that I think of, amongst many features that make a relationship successful. Three of the most important ones are that a couple is compatible with each other, that they share certain core values, uh, personality characteristics, interests that are really central to who they are. Uh, the second thing is that they're able to experience and express positive emotions with each other. And the third thing is that they're able to be resilient to external stressors to their relationship. So they know that a hard day at work is just a hard day at work, and they're able to separate that from their home life and their relationship. Unfortunately, the indicators of a successful amorous relationship are not or are no longer observed in a large number of couples. Can we call upon biology to lengthen and increase empathy in couples? To find out, scientists at the University of Zurich have developed tests based on oxytocin. Vaporize the spray twice in each nostril and breathe in deeply through the nose. We've tested in our laboratory if oxytocin can influence the conflict in a couple. And to do that, we've given oxytocin or a placebo to couples, and then we've asked them to argue, without them knowing whether they've had oxytocin or a placebo. Do I still matter to you? Of course. You don't listen to me. I might just as well have been talking to the wall. Well, go and talk to the wall, then. Do you have the impression that we gave you oxytocin or a placebo? It's hard to say. I don't know if that had an influence or if it's because I've had a good day. No idea. <laughs> We've noticed that the people who have taken oxytocin have less stress and behaviour which is more positive than those who took the placebo. I have to work at home. Don't act like you don't understand. Who's paying for everything? And how can we finance all this if I didn't work at home? But why can't you understand that? But not seven days a week. This makes me really angry. Stop. Stop. We're going to stop now. I've got the impression that you're really annoyed. You in particular seem very stressed to me. How do you feel now? Angegriffen. Very attacked, in confrontation, not good at all, but it's the same as usual. I don't think that you can use oxytocin in couple therapy to reinforce trust. I think it can be used to calm couples down over a limited period. These effects aren't specific to oxytocin. But I think the oxytocin receptors in the brain are relatively specific for attachment within couples. There are a lot of businesses on the internet which offer nasal sprays or medication with oxytocin and who say that this will improve faithfulness in couples. In my opinion, it's still a lot too early to spend money on this kind of product. So a quick hit of oxytocin, is that the solution to domestic disputes? But there's no need to call in chemistry. Affectionate kisses, if they're frequent, are quite enough. Even though you've been in a couple forever, we still see that in stable couples there's less and less tendency to kiss. 
and the couples that kiss a lot last longer. So I'm going to encourage you to kiss each other. So kiss. Women accord more importance to kisses. They feel that they count more and more as the couple lasts, while men think they count less and less. Very good. But did you exchange saliva? Not to the point of drowning. In fact, it's very important for Madame to receive saliva because that will activate in her the desire for attachment, complicity and intimacy. So carry on. Are you salivating? <laughs> Excuse me? Are you salivating? I don't like it much. Ah, oh, you don't like it. And you like it more? I prefer a bit more, but, well, I respect him. And there we are. And so you've been in a couple for a long time? 42 years. And you've always kept on kissing? Always. Always. Always with an exchange of saliva? Always, always. Oh, yes, as much as possible. Cuddles and caresses also liberate oxytocin. There you are. From the foreplay 42 years ago, and again today. Like couples who are younger, you make a lot of tongue movement. Yes. We can see that with experience, with age, this transforms into lip-against-lip -lip contact during a long embrace, and saliva is exchanged. Keep on kissing regularly and intensely. The kiss is a natural conjugal therapy to make a couple last. I love you, Frank. Uh, no, uh, I'm Jean-Pierre. Kisses maintain love, but they're not a solution for couples to rediscover their sexuality. We have seen that over the years, the level of cerebral substances that activate sexual desire have diminished. In the United States, Dr. Bloch, sexologist, practices therapy based on sexual contact. And uh, I guess it's that whole seven-year itch thing. We are having trouble, you know, in the bedroom, um, sexually connecting, I guess. Um, I'm really worried. Saying, I'm really worried about it. He's distracted and I need some attention. What's your perspective on this, Kevin? I'm, uh, you know, I'm working hard. I, I'm building a future for us. And, uh, you know, I come home tired and uh, it's tough. I understand. Yeah, I time for her. But you don't make time for sex, sex won't make time for you. <laughs> so how often do you two have sex? <laughs> like once a week. If that, it's a do it and done deal. There's not really any romance or. Do you share fantasies? We used to. Used to. We used to. Well, I'm glad you made time to come in here. Are you ready to make time for your sex life? Absolutely. That's why I'm here. I mean, I'd like to. Yeah, for sure. Nature provides for us to fall in lust for maybe a few months maybe a couple of years, where it's so exciting and so compelling that it's almost like we have no choice. But then nature kind of backs off. And if we let nature take its course, well, we're not in love anymore. We're not in lust anymore. We would move on to another, another partner. But there are ways to trick nature. Amanda, Kevin, welcome Hello. back to the Institute. Hey. Thank you. Wow, you look gorgeous. We look went at shopping. This. What a transformation. <laughs> she looks great. Hey, yeah. this stuff works. Uh, you look sure. very comfortable. Oh, great, come you. on in. One way to trick nature is just to wear something different, look different. Also, sharing fantasies tricks nature. If you just tell a fantasy to your partner, it's almost as if you really did do something new because the mind is one of the most important sex organs in the body. So have a seat and uh, make yourselves comfortable. Yeah. So you look just dazzling. Uh, really quite a difference from last time. Very colorful. She looks good. But sometimes a little darker is very sexy too. 
So um, we got you something to oh. put on. What is this? This oh, is your little boudoir outfit, and I, <laughs> I noticed that your husband is a very visual man, as most men are. Yeah. Ever do a strip right, tease for your husband? Yes, I'm long getting older. Long time ago, <laughs> long time ago. Men need to be teased because it makes them slow down. And women need to be teased because it makes us come around. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Don't be shy. Couples have a great deal of difficulty sharing fantasies. I mean, they might share everything, but when it comes to telling their innermost fantasy, they're really scared because they're afraid that the one they love will say, that's weird, or I don't want to do that, or that's disgusting. So that's really scary. So no wonder we don't want to share our fantasies. We're afraid of being judged by the one we love. You have been. Uh... Okay, well, I'll be your cabana boy. <laughs> yeah, I like yeah. Wow. Wow. Beautiful. Okay, so uh, then it'll be time for our next session. Uh, but before you go, I want to show you something. Watch the bonobos. See how similar they are to us. Well, they're a little hairier but their bodies are shaped in much the same way. But look how freely they move. They have no inhibitions. They find every part of themselves to be erotic. I want you to liberate your inner bonobo, to be inspired by these creatures who can teach us so much about our sexuality. Hey, Pupu. Tässä on Niiranen. Jaa, en kai keskeyttänyt paha. Terve, terve, ei mitään kerettiin jo lopetella. Onpas täällä kuuma. Teilläkin on hiki otsassa molemmilla. Aikamoinen epeli tuo sun vaimo. Ai jaa. Jaa. To avoid serial monogamy, some couples have decided to live in polygamy. Good. Well, today we're celebrating a very special day. I can only just dare to start with 30 years. So we're celebrating, Marie and me, our 30th wedding anniversary and 17 years of shared love with three, Denis, Marie and me. Denis, Marie and me. Jean. Jean. Open the Often, regularly, before Denis, Marie said to herself, I don't know what's missing in my life. It seems that I can feel a void regularly, all that. And since Denis in her life, she's never said that anymore. So when that happened, when we came into the house here with you, you had your own room, and then you moved in with us. We said to ourselves that we'd try a few months to see what happened. You tried with us, and then it worked. Here in the house, we all sleep in our own bedroom. Everyone has their own bedroom. We've always had separate bedrooms, all three of us, because we like it like that. We like to have our own space at night. And more, the fact that Marie has sex with Denis, I don't see any problem with that. I don't feel that I'm in any way losing. In a couple, often the other person tends to be either Wonder Woman or a Superman. So it's all up to me to fulfill the need of the other person. And that's impossible. So if Denis can bring his thing which makes Marie rock, well, I just have to be me. What I'm not, Denis is, and vice versa. So we're not competing, but complementary. You, Denis, when you met Marie there, and then you knew she was, uh, you knew she had a husband at home. Well, me, I said to myself, I really don't understand that jealousy. It wasn't an obstacle. It was quite open, I think it was quite open. It wasn't an obstacle, no, and I can't see what could have separated us. In a lot of traditional couples that I see, there's a loss of liberty, which is where the popular idea comes from, of tomorrow I get married, 
tomorrow I'm hanging myself, and if I leave my partner, I'll be free once more. When Marie owned up to me that she loved two men at once, I looked at the possible solutions. There weren't any. There weren't because Marie was happy. That was good. Let her go with him. Tell Marie that I don't want to know anything about him. That would have broken the couple, all that. So, well, I said that we'd have to invent a solution. Well, there are lots of hidden trios, because lovers, mistresses, those are all trios there. And I'm sure that they're not just sexual affairs there. There are people who love enormously in there. Good evening. I need a table for three. Come on, then. Thanks. There are a lot of people who tell me that Marie is a fraternal relationship, friends, a flatmate, that I'm forcing myself to live with an ex who's with someone else now, when you have that vision of the duo at any price. And then I tell them, the love that I felt at the start for Marie, well, that's still buzzing in the same place. I've got friends, I've got brothers, I have sisters, and that isn't at all the same thing. You have to believe that I have a heart big enough to love both as much as each other. If you were to put a polyamorous couple into a brain scanner and show them a photograph of their long-term uh, partner and show them a photograph of their sweetheart, I think you would find uh, activity in brain regions associated with deep attachment for the long-term partner and brain regions associated with intense romantic love for the sweetheart. I think we've evolved three distinctly different brain systems for mating and reproduction. One is the sex drive, the second one is feelings of intense romantic love, and the third is feelings of deep attachment to a partner. The problem is that you can feel deep attachment for one individual and then swing into wild feelings of uh, romantic love for somebody else and also feel the sex drive for a host of other individuals. These three brain systems don't always work together. This is why some couples have invented polylove. Hello, Professor René Zayan. You're a couple of polyamorous. What are polyamorous relationships? Well, polyamorous relationships are relationships which are multiple, but which are neither polygamy nor swapping. Each person allows the other to have multiple relationships without jealousy, without exclusivity, faithfully, but a faithfulness which isn't exclusive, a fidelity which lasts. So if I understand this, you tell each other everything and don't live a lie. Cheating doesn't mean anything anymore. From the moment that you say, I have multiple relationships, if you're not with someone or you're with others, it's not cheating because from the start, in fact, they know it. Of course, and so there's no jealousy. There's less possibility of jealousy. Have you happened to meet some of Jean's partners? Well, yes, I've met some. It's really nice. On the other hand, he's met some of mine too, and that's gone very, very well. In a really friendly way, and without any jealousy. <laughs> and you, Jean? You haven't known a woman where the other was jealous and wanted that exclusivity with you? Yes, unfortunately, because it's quite ordinary to find women who demand that exclusivity. If the relationship is working relatively well, after a certain time, that demand for exclusivity will lead to a breakup. And well, you can suffer from that, because every relationship, even if it's multiple, is important to me. And so, yes, I can suffer from this. But is that one of the reasons for which you don't want to live together with your girlfriends? That happens a fair bit in Canada. Yes, but everyone has their own way of having relationships. And I'm not very group. In some ways, living together poses more problems in the framework of multiple relationships. You have to justify each absence somewhere. 
But what's important as well is to specify from the start the type of relationship that's happening, just so as to avoid conflicts of that kind following. This Belgian couple are polyamorous and long-term lovers. But are there differences or similarities in the brains of short and long-term lovers? So, Pat and Ed, yes. are you ready? Yes, yes, we are. Two lovers, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> we did find some differences in the brain between those who were in love long-term, people in their 50s, and those who had just fallen in love who were in their early 20s. Among those who had just fallen in love and were in their 20s, we found a lot of activity in a brain region linked with anxiety, for good reason. When you've just fallen in love, you're, you're scared. You, why didn't he call? Am I too fat? You're anxious when you've just fallen in love. But among our people who were in love long term, there was no longer any indication of anxiety. But that early anxiety is now replaced with calm. Thank you for coming. I'm delighted to hear that you've been in love for 45 years. And you're still in love. And we're going to go take a look and see what's going on in your brain. See those brain regions that uh, become activated when you look at her face. Mm. Me first. <laughs> OK. <laughs> we found activity in a brain region that was exactly the same activity that we found among people who had just fallen madly in love. It's a tiny little factory near the base of the brain called the ventral tegmental area. And we found the activity in certain cells called the A10 cells. These are cells that actually make dopamine, which is a natural stimulant. And then it sends this dopamine to many parts of the brain, giving people that rush of, uh, of infatuation, that feeling of ecstasy. So we've proven that love can last. Right there. Yeah. <laughs> you knew you were in love, but I can be in love at any age, and all your friends can really believe you now. Now they believe it. Unchain my heart, baby, let it go. Unchain my heart, baby, let it go. But what lets old people stay passionate? Unchain my heart. Dr. Arthur Aaron thinks that the more your partner stimulates your life, the more your engagement towards him or her will be reinforced. If a couple is doing activities that are not only positive, but exciting, challenging, that they feel that excitement of overcoming obstacles, and they're doing it together, that's what creates the sense of self-expanding that enriches the relationship. Purpose of this study was to test the effect of doing an exciting, challenging activity together on the quality of your relationship. Are you all set over there to begin? Mm -hmm. OK. And your partner is all set in there? OK, let's begin. What we're looking for in the brain when a person does an exciting thing with their partner, such as this video game, is activation, that is more activity in the part of the brain that we call the reward area, or the dopamine reward area. The part of the brain that becomes active when we have something really wonderful we're expecting. We know from our research that there are some couples who years later, 20, 30 years into a marriage, are as much in love as when they first met, excitedly in love. We don't know for sure yet what accounts for it. But we do know from our own research and others what probably accounts for it. They have the essentials. They are not depressed or anxious. They're not under great stress. They've got good communication skills. They've got support from others. And beyond those essentials, they are self-expanding together.
In the end, we form couples in hope and they last as long as is possible. The ideal is fidelity and we try to stay faithful to the same one person as often as possible before seeking a new first kiss. <laughs>